So, uh, thank you, Gilbert. Uh, thank you, all of you. I am invited to present to you a reading, my reading, of the 60 last years, say, uh, from after World War II to this day, which happened to coincide to my active life from the age of 20 until now, and uh, <coughs> Uh, in which I was continuously, and I continue to be as long as possible, involved as an activist of uh, what I would say the rise of, of the South, uh, the uh, <coughs> Renaissance of the South. <coughs> um, now, um, I noticed recently that I had read uh, Karl Marx's uh, Capital, four times in my life, exactly every 20 years, at the age of 20, 40, 60, 80, uh, which happened to have coincided with, uh, with important changes in the deployment of the global system. And uh, each time, uh, therefore, I read it a little differently, uh, because asking myself the questions of the time. And uh, <coughs> I did find a, a lot of... Uh, instruments to understand it, but I remained unsatisfied each time in the sense that my exclusive or major central question, which is why uh, <coughs> capitalism has been polarizing and why uh, the countries which are the majority of humankind are un have been unable to catch up, that is to become uh, similar to in their capitalist development to the centers. I did not find any answer in Marx. Uh, but instead of thinking as many people that, well, that means that Marx belongs to the past, um, I thought just that it was uh, unfinished. Uh, and that uh, the answer to the question could not be an economistic uh, an uh, uh, answer, but should oh, use or make use of the instruments of historical materialism that is associating uh, uh, the economic dimension of uh, social life with uh, all the rest, which is no less important. And I, I think until now that there are no better tools uh, in the sense that any alternative tool to try to understand the world, uh, whether Weber or whether any, any, anybody else, is far <coughs> less efficient than using the, Mar the Marx tools. Far less efficient. Uh, not to say about conventional economics, which is really something uh, uh, of no value at all. Hmm? Uh, therefore... <coughs> I may say that I have never been an economist of development or a development economist. I have been a critique of development economics even before development economics existed as such. My uh, PhD thesis, which was written in 54, 55, the title of which, the real title, Accumulation on a World Scale, was an anti Rostov six years before the book of Rostov on stages of development appeared, that it was rejecting a theory of linear development <coughs> which could be reproduced with time lag from uh, the north to the south, say, uh, precisely because the system was global and that the logic of the system uh, was creating, producing, and reproducing and deepening polarization. That is the impossibility of catching up. And since development economics is the art to catch up, it's uh, simply uh, <coughs> uh, a formulation which does not coincide with the historical possibility. And therefore, it is necessarily nonsense, hmm? uh, useless, hmm? at least. Now, that being said, uh, I would add to that that my reading today which was gradually, of course. I, I don't think that everything was uh, in my head uh, already at the age of 20. Uh, it would be absolutely ridiculous. Uh, but which 
developed gradually my reading of historical capitalism, to use Wallerstein's uh, uh, phrase, or call it as you want, uh, really existing capitalism, capitalism as a historical reality, um, has a trajectory which is far different from the usual vision of, let's say, Eurocentric, also more reading of uh, history of civilization, and which is more different even from the reading, the poor reading or the non-reading of conventional economics. That is a very long <coughs> preparatory, uh, a, a very long preparation maybe 10 centuries, not just the three last centuries, so-called mercantilist, and not involving exclusively, but only late, uh, some European societies, but starting rather in the East, uh, starting with China at the time of the Sung in the 10th uh, century. Uh, a series of waves with uh, uh, each wave coming after the other and building a little more until perhaps the last well-known wave, Eurocentric, um, the wave of mercantilism from the discovery and the conquest of the Americas, not the discovery, the people who were there had discovered it before, uh, <clears throat> but the conquest of the Americas, 1500, to the double revolution, the English Industrial Revolution and the French Political Revolution, um, end of, 18, of, of, of 18th century. Then a very short period, very short period of, um, uh, of mature capitalism appearing in all its, the 19th century, a short period, very short period in history. Um, and it, it, it was precisely the time of Marx who uh, understood uh, and explained uh, the logic, uh, the historical logic, and the uh, uh, way that this system is reproducing itself in that uh, 19th century. Then, and starting very early, what I would call today a long decline, uh, starting with uh, this mature capitalism moving fast towards the end of the 19th century to uh, monopoly capital, that is the opposite of what is being called about transparent uh, 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 competition, uh, real pri true prices, and so on, all the blah blah of uh, market economy, uh, <clears throat> a long decline, which coincides with the first wave also of the rise, we call it the South. Now it was called the East, uh, it's both the East and the South the peripheries, precisely those societies which in the historical, in the very short period of the 19th century had been turned into peripheries of that mature capitalism, even if there were some preparation before, but okay. Now, uh, <clears throat> a, long, a long decline, and this decline coincided, as I said, with this uh, rise of the peripheries. If you look at the 20th century, how it starts. It starts 1905 in Russia, semi-periphery or a periphery, which announced 1917. It starts with 1911 in China, which announced the long series leading <coughs> to 1949. It starts with uh, the revolution in a smaller country, 1907 in Iran, but which has a very big importance. It started with the uh, Young Turks, which announced uh, uh, Ataturk and uh, something different, which announced in its way in Gamal Abdel Nasser 30 years later, etc., etc. Uh, all important events in the periphery which announced the 20th century, or uh, what, what has started changing the world, started eh, changing. I would call that 20th century the first wave of the rise of the peripheries. And now my presentation will go along three periods. One, the, um, the first wave itself, the Bandung era, 
from 1955 to 1975 or 80, it's something very important, let's say 75, then the, uh, this system, and that will be tomorrow, this system coming out of steam and uh, er eroded and breaking down, um, opening uh, the offensive of uh, capital, but with change in its nature and in, in its... Uh, um, in, in its uh, um, structure, so-called neoliberal. I'll tell tomorrow why it's nonsense to call it neoliberal, but anyway. And then this short period uh, ending, and we are living in the, the end of that period, and starting perhaps, and probably, a second wave of the rise of the peripheries. Uh, what is happening in China particularly is indicative of that, but it's not alone. Now, I, I shall therefore take the uh, historical um, lineament uh, for my presentation, uh, but focusing not on events uh, in three lectures, it's impossible, but rather on major issues, major challenges, and major, right or wrong, answers which are given, uh, particularly from, from those who who want to build something else than capitalism, or at least um, catch up, perhaps, want to catch up, even if they fail to do so, uh, within the logic of the system. Now, um, the first uh, long wave of the rise of, cap of the South coincides, and not by pure chance, with the first long crisis, that is, uh, the crisis started, the first long crisis started exactly one century before the second one. Uh, economic historian says 1873. I'm not, uh, it's not important what, whether it is 73 or 75. 80, yeah? uh, just as the second one started in 1971 or 73 or 75, just one century later. A long with a number of characteristics which um, are very similar in the two long crises, and that's interesting. They are also different, of course, but um, a sudden and brutal um, move down of the rates of growth, which, of course, in the 18th, 19th century had been far less than it were, they were in the 20s, but, and capital reacting capital reacting to that challenge by three uh, sets of measures, of, uh, of strategies. One, concentration and centralization of uh, the control of capital, monopoly capital. Second, globalization. And third, financialization. Today we can speak of also a system which has these characteristics. We'll see later the, in, in, which, in what respect they are similar and different, but um, now, uh, it was the first wave of monopoly capital, uh, Hilferding, Hobson, uh, Lenin, uh, Lenin uh, drawing the political con uh, conclusion of that ch uh, qualitative change in relation without even having perhaps been fully aware with the rise of the peripheries, starting with the weak link, Russia, that is a periphery at that time, or a semi-periphery. I won't go into more details. Now, um, that is the, uh, the monopoly capital um, as one of the dimensions of the response, which, by the way, annihilate completely the nonsense of conventional economics, which is the pure and perfect market, etc., etc., with transparent competition, uh, revealing the true prices and leading to equilibrium be between supply and demand, all this respond to an imaginary system, not to uh, historical capitalism, of uh, generalized markets, uh, which has nothing to do with, with reality, and, and therefore it's pure ideology yeah? and pure legitimation of the practices of capital, nothing more just as we have seen it, we can say uh, there have been other examples of uh, uh, ideologies to legitimate some practice, for instance, in really existing socialism, but 
uh, that is something very common in the history of humankind. Now, the other dimension was globalization, uh, which took at that time the first wave, very, very brutal form, colonization, that is simply annihilating the independence of people, whatever you, however you call them, and it's, it's really globalization. It's not something new. There had been waves before preparation with the conquest of the Americas and so on, but I don't want to go into far past. Huh? And, and financialization. Uh, the city of London and the financial role of the city of London and of Wall Street have not been created uh, at the time of Bush, huh? they, but in 1900. Uh, that was a first wave of financialization. Now, um, this is my reading today of this. Now, how this first long crisis was concluded? By a number of insignificant events, such as World War I, the Russian Revolution, uh, the crisis of the 30s, Nazism, Imperial Japan, the Second World War, uh, uh, the uh, Chinese Revolution, all insignificant uh, events because they are not considered by development economics as being part of the uh, of the of the questions. They are not economic questions. Huh? Uh, but this is how the balance of forces was changed to socialist, not to socialist, but was changed for sure. Uh, and we can say without uh, pre being too pretentious to a large extent to the benefit, to the benefit, uh, reshaping re uh, in which the peripheries did exist, uh, uh, not simply as colonies with no voice and uh, uh, submitted to the um, structural adjustment. Now, this was my question. My first answer was my PhD thesis, accumulation on a world scale on which I wrote, the periphery are submitted to a permanent structural adjustment. The words are there, there. structural, unilateral, that is being uh, adjusted in order to facilitate the reproduction of accumulation at the centers and at that uh, unequal arrangement of the global system that is um, um, a, a, a permanent uh, adjustment which uh, not allow for catching up, but on the opposite, is uh, making catching up impossible in, its, in the frame of that logic. And therefore, uh, that uh, one, if one look at the history that way, I won't repeat, it means that development economics is simply starting by a false question, and necessarily any response to a false question can be of little interest. Now, um, therefore, today, what I shall see, what I shall try to uh, offer you, is uh, the panorama of the first uh, period from 1945, and uh, the end of the war, to, let's say, to put a date, 1975, the beginning of the second long crisis. Hmm? Now, that period, thanks to those insignificant events, eh, um, uh, started with a global system, globalized, but with three, uh, three uh, faces. Social democracy in the developed capitalist imperialist center, really existing socialism, call it as you want, in Soviet Union, Eastern Europe, and China, and third wall, or Afro-Asian rather than Afro-Asian, but I, I'll say a word about Latin America, Afro-Asian, I call them national popular, not populist, national popular attempts to simultaneously enlarge the margin of, of maneuver within the system, but come into conflict also with the logic of the system. Um, now, we had the, those three we can call them three patterns of regulation of accumulation uh, uh, with different historical and social and, and therefore political content um, and which were 
if one wants, wants to say the three of them, to some extent, progressive, in the sense that they allowed, and it's very funny, they allowed very high rates, so one can be very critical about that, but they allowed very high rates of growth, they allowed for, uh, let's call it full employment, they allowed for a massive change in the levels of education and health, none of those, those things being particularly negative. It's very funny that uh, the, th the, the three decades of after World War II, when social democracy was social democracy, uh, uh, um, that were characterized by high rates of growth, full employment, uh, um, uh, inequality, uh, the same level of uh, equality or inequality in the distribution of income, that is wages raising at the level of average productivity uh, in the economies, are considered come having been hell and bad. And the beautiful thing that zero growth with uh, massive unemployment was with growing inequality. This is the good pattern. It's very funny how things are presented. I mean, just the opposite of the banal reality. Hmm? Now, um, we had these three patterns. The Eastern one was the product itself of that revolution, starting with the Russian Revolution, which was a revolution in the periphery, and faced the problems that we continue to face, not only in Russia, but all over the world, or at least for 85% of humankind. That is, if we start something, we are limited by the fact that we inherit, we start by inheriting a uh, weak economy, a backward economy, call it as you want, low levels of productivity, and so on and so forth. Huh? And, and with all the limitations and the internal contradictions which arise from that starting from the periphery. I won't go further in philosophy in saying perhaps uh, history has been continuously a history of unequal development and of uh, the start of change from the peripheries, etc., which would be the opposite of Eurocentric and the opposite also of reverse Eurocentric, such as Islamocentric or Hindu-centric or whatever it is. Hmm? Now, this is, um, and and we had, and we had very very quickly in the south um, uh, a, a a project. Uh, which became a reality of, um, of historical change. Now, it is Bandung. Now, I happen, uh, I have been a communist all, all, all my life, and I remain, and uh, perhaps because of some reasons, I had the enormous uh, pure chance huh, that I was the junior, I was 20 years old at that time, in a team which brought together communists of the Middle East, Iran was basic, uh, Egypt, Syria, Iraq, and some other countries, um, to discuss, in, that was in 1950, to discuss, and 50-51, and there are writings uh, and a, a magazine published at that time in Paris, Le Moyen-Orient, reflecting that, discussing, starting by rejecting the uh, Truman uh, Churchill was the inventor, Truman could not invent anything important, hmm? uh, of the two worlds, the free and the uh, beyond the uh, Iron Curtain, etc., etc., two worlds, two. Hmm? And two years later, one year later, Zdanov, with Stalin, produced a famous report on two worlds also, but calling them capitalist and socialist. And we say, no, there are three worlds. The South, which, the, which uh, the West was classifying in the free world because it was free for capital, but not, of course, for the people who were still colonized. Huh? Um, and um, uh, how do you classify them in the uh, free world? And <coughs> Zdanov, uh, you belong to the capitalist, capitalist system. Yes, but we have a curious position in that capitalist system. Huh? that we are peripheries and we are uh, revolting against this position. And we started thinking that, uh, no, we should see, we should reject both. We should reject, no, we did not reject Zdanov at that time. Huh? Uh, we were too respectful. 
but we said it should be formulated differently. And it happened that we entered in contact with uh, Chuen Lai, uh, without knowing that there was a team in China around Chuen Lai, just one or two years after <coughs> the establishment of, the new, uh, of new China, thinking also on that question. And the answer of, of uh, oral answer uh, of um, Chuen Lai, which was transferred to us by a Chinese com comrade who came specially for that, his name is Wang Hui, He's, he died since, um, told us, Chuen Lai says, think by yourself. It was very diplomatic. Huh? He didn't say the Jean of report, <laughs> you should throw it into the basket. Think by yourself, which was very encouraging. I think this was the origin of Bandung. It didn't come out. It didn't come out of the minds of Nehru, Socarno, a fortiori uh, Nasser, which at that time had no idea at all of anything. Uh, but it came out of Chuen Lai, out of uh, a number of communists. We happen to have learned later in the 60s that there was, has been something very similar in India, which gave the uh, CPM appearing different from CPI, uh, and similar in uh, the Philippines, and uh, also in Indonesia, the debate within the Communist Party uh, before being, uh, being uh, uh, the massive assassinations of 66, uh, <clears throat> etc. That is, it was finally a good number of communist parties, organizations, of the peripheries, it was not Latin America, which was totally Euro, Euro thinking, yeah? and Soviet thinking as, at that time. Eh? It's no more th that, fortunately, but it was that. Now, this is the origin of Bandung. This is the origin of Bandung. Now, Bandung, therefore, was uh, crystallized and, and turned into also at political level non-alignment. Bandung was 55, Don Alignment started formally in 60. Um, but uh, <clears throat> that is a project of, uh, let us avoid qualifying it socialist or, 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 or capitalist. Many of them qualified themselves to socialist, but that's not the point. Huh? And to say they were not socialists, they were capitalists, is not also the point, because it was indeed something consistent in conflict with the logic of imperialism and saying uh, and having the target of uh, moving into industrialization in conflict with the logic of capitalism because historical capitalism of the 19th century has built what? A periphery, center periphery was de facto synonymous to industrialized, to non-industrialized or even de-industrialized uh, that was the case of India, uh, particularly, uh, non-industrialized versus non-industrialized. Therefore, moving from that position into industrialization of the peripheries is not the logic of capital accumulation, of really existing capital accumulation, which is imperialist capital accumulation and which is reproducing and deepening the, but, uh, the, the uh, polarization but a, a conflict with that logic. That is a very important point because many, even Marxists and respectable, analyze it as the logic of capital accumulation through the industrialization of the South at the apparent uh, uh, surface economic level, it may look uh, reasonable. But if you take the historical materialist uh, complete picture that is giving to classes, nations, states, their role in the making of history, uh, uh, it, is, it is based on a conflict and not on the deployment of the logic of capital accumulation. That is, therefore, the, uh, the beginning. Now, I happen to have been a little more mature I was around 40 at that time instead of 20, and I was involved personally, <laughs> at least in two cases in Egypt 
and in Mali to the attempt of deployment of that project, which I qualified not long after, but sometime after as a, a national popular, hmm? and not populist, national popular. And I will say something about it. Um, but I have also been a consultant, if you want to say so, or because of political activities in relation with comrades elsewhere, uh, discussing this matter also for other countries, particularly in Asia and Africa, and lit later, much later, with Latin, Amer Latin Americans. Now, now they, uh, the, uh, the, um, therefore, the ingredients were created to have three systems, and not two, uh, imperialist centers, the triad, uh, US, Europe, and Japan, the East, both Soviet and Chinese, which developed differently uh, very, from very, very early, from 50, 55, 57, uh, and, but still with some characteristics common, and the South, or the South in plural, because there was an enormous variety of, but belonging to that same global family. The three being completing one another and in conflict, simultaneously in conflict. The conflicts were, could be, so I, my reading is not the reading of the Cold War. Huh? I, I think this is nonsense to read the year after Second World War as a Cold War. Huh? Cold War was an invention of the US propaganda hmm? uh, and it was turned into a re reality. But only one facet, this is one facet and it reduces completely the tremendous change which started from the peripheries, the third partner in that uh, 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 trilateral system, I would say, or three basis system. Now, to make the, uh, we can discuss, and there is no time to discuss it, what were the, you see, uh, the uh, national, why I call them national popular experiences or if national popular phase or attempt uh, coinciding with the first wave. Uh, the first wave in the peripheries under the flag of socialism and Marxism, Soviet Union and China, and or under the flag of national liberation associated with social transformation and including to various degrees, radical changes, uh, to various degrees uh, in the social organization. Now, um, this is why I'm coming back, qualifying or trying to qualify too quickly where they socialist or even if they had socialist intent and serious ones in the case of uh, Soviet Union and China for sure and some others. Hmm? Uh, or not understanding exactly what it is, but still moving in that direction in some other places, or capitalist because it was still based on, uh, on uh, patterns of organization of labor, submitting labor to uh, to those uh, who take the decision and who are owners or not owners formally, uh, um, and, and therefore not socialist. Um, relations, not communist relations, one should say, but that's another uh, question on which maybe in the discussion we can come. Now, what were the uh, limits and contradictions? Um, most of the limits came out of the fact that the project was thought from above, from a minority, from minorities, I don't want to call them petit bourgeois or middle class from minorities, uh, which had a project of, let's call it the banal and which could be discussed, modernization associated to industrialization, anti-imperialist and aware of the clash with imperialists, particularly at the political level, hmm? not culturalist, not culturalist at all. Nobody says we are... Uh, Muslims, or we are Hindus, or we are, I don't know what, at that time. Hmm? Uh, 
nationalist in the good sense of the term, that is, uh, whether we are or we are not, we are a nation. Whether we are or we are not, we can open the debate of what is a nation uh, historically and what are the variety of nations, but we are. Uh, and and in, that, uh, in that sense, we ought to be uh, respected. Hmm? Uh, and have and participate actively in the shaping of the world that is rejecting that unilateral structural adjustment uh, um, and all that goes with the uh, uh, economic uh, unilateral structural adjustment that is the uh, political submission to the policies or the global policies decided by the strongest that is particularly the US and behind as usual the Europeans. Now, the, um, the, the, and therefore, with no democracy, you know, I am not a democrat in the sense that I don't think that democracy can be summarized. In, if you have multi-party elections, you have a democracy. You have a masquerade, uh, including in the West. Uh, uh, but, uh, okay. But, uh, <clears throat> but um, uh, not an alternative democracy that is banal, the trivial word participatory, or I don't know what, huh? that is in which uh, the popular classes uh, organize themselves by themselves and therefore become a real uh, partner, even if they are not alone, <laughs> if uh, some other classes are also organized, um, uh, whether they are ally or enemies, whether they are, can be neutralized or included in the alliance and so on. That is, we had uh, systems which achieved uh, with, without democracy or without, I prefer, democratization of the society, which is a wider concept than, uh, than so-called uh, the blueprint of uh, political democracy. Um, and showing social progress, I'm not saying socialism, but social progress, in some cases, some land, land reforms, uh, in many cases, by a, uh, through education, a, uh, a moving up in the social hierarchy uh, uh, and, 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 and widening the middle classes, the educated, semi-educated middle classes, and so on, um, and um, reinforcing a degree of national sovereignty uh, that is of capacity to negotiate, really, with the dominant forces whether at, uh, at uh, um, economic or at political and inclusive uh, uh, security and military affairs with the dominant forces. That means that there was a sovereign project. Now, that sovereign project gave, we can call it state capitalism, but state capitalism is uh, so wide. It includes uh, so many uh, patterns of state capitalism which are historically different. We have each time to give it a more precise social content uh, to that uh, state capitalism and therefore also the capacity of that state capitalism to evolve in one direction or another. Now in that case, we had a state capitalism which doesn't exclude that there were also private property and private capitalism, depending the, of, the, of the countries to various degrees, but um, in which, and not just a so-called bureaucratic state control, the vision of the World Bank about what it was, which was, which as usual with the World Bank is nonsense and is wrong. Huh? Uh, <coughs> but, but with a social content which included as active members, middle classes, the new middle classes educated, uh, the popular support of the popular classes, excluded perhaps some, not necessarily always, uh, uh, segments of the previous ruling classes, call it aristocracy in some cases, feudalism was the usual word, bad, bad, bad also, but used by historical Marxists, and, uh, and the comprador. Hmm? Now, and I think that uh, my personal experience uh, convinced me that even in very different conditions, historical and, and, and on the terrain, as Egypt as compared to Bali, there were very, very strong similar 
uh, 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 characteristics. Now, that uh, led, you know, recently there is the publication of a book on Amilcar Cabral, with whom I had long discussions at that time on the so-called suicide of the petty bourgeoisie. Yeah? Um, I think uh, he was wrong. Huh? Uh, he called it petit bourgeoisie, we can call it different. The nascent ruling classes, uh, the nascent leadership of a new historical bloc, national popular, hmm? uh, with a variety of classes. This nascent uh, ruling class did not co commit suicide, but on the opposite reinforced its uh, unilateral uh, control of the power. Now, um, now, that leads me also to an important point which I observed uh, relatively early, but uh, which uh, I think I uh, understood better later. Uh, the famous uh, analysis of Mao on the reality being three layers, not one, not class only. Uh, state, nation, people. And by state, meaning the ruling class. And meaning the ruling class, not meaning the capitalist ruling class necessarily, but also meaning those new ruling class coming out of the leadership of a historical bloc which has been uh, in conflict with the logic of imperialism and capitalism, which meant also the Communist Party of China, fire on the headquarters. Eh? Now, the, that is the state. Second is the nation. The nation, call it as you want, eh, is another level of reality. Uh, uh, Mrs. Thatcher said once that she never met a nation but only individuals, while in the Falkland War she proved that she knew what Britain was as a nation, good or bad, eh, in that, uh, for, the, for the event. <laughs> uh, it, it does exist. Eh? One of the uh, terrible... Uh, weakness of the European system is that it negates a strong historical reality, the nations. Eh? Uh, and that whether we are or we are not, whether Senegal is or is not a nation, that's not, we can have long discussions and we can say perhaps uh, China for sure or Egypt for sure, the Arab nation, I don't know, uh, this or that, but a nation. Uh, that is a historical reality with a history, a political culture coming out of that history, which has its uh, peculiarities. I do not reduce it at all. It's not a culturalist position. Eh? It's an anti-culturalist because the laws which govern the formation the, of those political cultures, historical political culture, are not specific to a race or to a people belonging to a set of, to a religion or another, but are, um, are common to humankind. But they operate in different historical formations. Um, and that the nation, the state, and I come back, and people's meaning not everybody, eh? but meaning uh, the popular classes, that is the classes which are exploited, dominated, and oppressed, which is not necessarily uh, renewed, can not, necessarily be reduced to the uh, uh, so-called proletariat or the industrial proletariat. Now, what Mao said is the state want, want independence, the nation liberation, the people's revolution. That is the state, the ruling class, wants to enjoy as far as possible a barging that allows them to be participating to the shaping of the world not just subject. Now, if the circumstances, that is the state, which means in our conditions of the peripheries, if the circumstances, created partly by the struggles, allow for such a margin, they become national. Even one would say nationalist, huh? but in the good sense. If no, well, they accept submission, and they become comprador. So the theory was there is not a bourgeois, a national bourgeoisie visible, and the comprador, the good and the bad, and the comprador one, the bad ones, it's the same class, which is national, 
or comprador or partly national, partly comprador, according to the circumstances. And among those circumstances, the internal balance of force between them and the popular classes. Second, the nation want liberation. That is, might be understood in a culturalist way that they want to, to say we are speaking Arabic or we are Muslim or we are, I don't know what, huh? uh, as such. No, it means uh, we, uh, in order to capitalize on the history and on our history of political culture, we have to, uh, we, we cannot just submit to the logic of the global system dominated by, uh, by some. And the people's want revolution. It's a big word, huh? not revolution with a capital R, huh? uh, which means that potentially, not, uh, not necessarily actually, the oppressed dominated uh, classes uh, uh, would, would, would support moving beyond capitalism. And that you cannot understand the reality if you suppress one of the three terms. You have to take them in their complementarity and conflict and interaction. You cannot, therefore, neither develop a geostrategy of uh, nations, of states, the classical geostrategy, uh, geopolitics, huh? the classical one, the bourgeois one, huh? there are only states and uh, interaction among states is the decisive factor. This is one side. And you cannot take the other extreme. There are only classes. And the class, uh, exploited class are uh, revolutionary or are uh, uh, um, struggling for um, changing the, the world. Yes, but there is. A, and there is, in, in between, I don't know if it is in between, there is a third dimension, which I mentioned. Now, I think that is, that is I, but I'm coming to, towards the end of my first presentation. That is how I read the, um, it, it has been perhaps a little abstract, uh, too abstract, but general. Uh, how I read the Bandung period. Now, in that, I, we could go endlessly into details, but and in, uh, that the so-called neo-colonial, to which extent they were neo-colonial. You know, Gabon was neo-colonial, but it was a member of the non-aligned movement, and it would have never uh, um, enjoyed the enormous oil rent wi without uh, non-alignment. <laughs> Uh, whether it wasted this uh, uh, rent is another affair. Huh? But uh, ca you cannot therefore uh, reduce it to just neo-colonial and, and forget about the overall uh, stage. Now, what has happened during this, uh, this first wave, first wave, to summarize and conclude with this summary before moving tomorrow to the second stage of the, that history. Uh, what we uh, has been achieved is that some have moved far in industrialization, other very little. Those who have moved far were those who had made a revolution under the flag of uh, socialism, uh, Soviet Union, China, China creating the basis for it, huh, which deployed later. But uh, sovereign project, we, uh, a strong one. And the others, to various degrees. Now, and in the case of most of African, Arab, and Muslim countries, but that would lead to another set of problems, little of it. Uh, not necessarily zero, but very little of it. Which will explain also the second wave later that will be the third uh, lecture. Now, I introduce here Latin America later, uh, uh, not only because I personally discovered it late, <laughs> uh, but it was also a late comer in this uh, global history, if we call it so, uh, in the sense that it was terribly Americanocentric, uh, in the sense that uh, Monroe, uh, Monroe uh, doctrine, the domination of the US over the whole continent, uh, the European-minded uh, vision 
uh, of the ruling classes, historical ruling classes of Latin America. Um, the, uh, and along with that, the den denying uh, the existence even of the Indian, uh, American Indian component of the nations. Um, and, uh, uh, and even for the left, the historical communist parties, until the, uh, uh, the coup against Allende and the uh, second wave of, uh, with Guevarism, with Mir in, uh, in Chile and so on, of a new uh, approach of, uh, of the radical left, and with the whole evolution of Cuba, but that would lead, lead us somewhere else. Um, we had uh, things which were similar uh, in very different conditions from what happened in Asia and Africa. That is, we had the desarroismo in Latin America, which was uh, the um, illusion of being able to catch up, uh, that was premish, huh? catch up within the logic of the system through uh, a, a series of uh, reforms which would allow uh, industrial, which would open the way to industrialization and to the um, um, uh, uh, building of uh, middle classes uh, wrongly associated to a demand of democracy. Yeah? Uh, now, so that, that is the picture of, of, of that time. Now, uh, It came out of steam pretty quickly. And when the three system, it's uh, very interesting to see that the three system, and I'll come to that tomorrow, the three system uh, broke down social democracy, uh, historical socialism, and uh, national popular systems broke down uh, simultaneously or almost in the same relatively short period. Uh, uh, the, the third, uh, third of the uh, 20th century. So that is my reading of that first wave. And I call it the first wave of the rise of the peripheries. Uh, and I look at it not as a gigantic failure, either gigantic failure of the socialist dream, Soviet Union and China, or the gigantic failure of the nationalist dream, the other countries, and that everything will come uh, better with, uh, with uh, negating uh, the state, negating the nation, uh, and, uh, and, and, uh, and uh, uh, accepting the logic of globalization, which uh, as a frame for catching up in, and th in the system and by means of the system, that means within really existing global capitalism and by capitalist means. Well, the third lecture will be that this cannot work, and it's something else which is starting, and, and not that. So maybe we should stop at that point in order to allow for some discussion. Thank you. <laughs>